مبارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وعز المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين سيما بقية الله روحيه وأرواح العالمين له الفداء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا قال الله الحكيم في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يمنون عليك أن أسلموا قل لا تمنوا علي إسلامكم بل الله يمن عليكم أن هداكم للإيمان بل الله يمن عليكم أن هداكم للإيمان كنتم صادقين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد المؤمنين المؤمنات brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله as we are commemorating next week uh, on Tuesday, Monday night will be the Shahada of Imam Muhammad Al-Jawad alayhi afdal salawat wa tahiyyat and inshallah tonight we will commemorate and remember this Imam in these short minutes that we have inshallah before prayers we offer our condolences to the present Imam and all Mu'mineen and Mu'minat on the martyrdom of his great-grandfather, Imam Muhammad Al-Jawad, alayhi afdal salawat wa tahiyyat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One of the concepts that often comes to mind and should be a question that we all ask ourselves is the role of mankind or my role in this world. In other words, why am I here? What is my purpose here? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create me? What can I do? What should I do to fulfill the purpose of my creation? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create for no reason. There is no abath. We call it abath in the Arabic terminology and the term terminology of the Holy Quran. In other words, it's not, there's nothing that has no purpose. Us humans living in this world, we might sometimes say something that has no purpose or has no benefit. 
or we might do something that has no specific benefit. Yet, if somebody does or says something that they don't have a purpose in mind, you consider that as an act of madness. If I do something as a aqil, as someone who has intellect, whatever I do, I have to do for a reason, some purpose in mind. I might be joking, I do something or say something, or might be passing a message, I might be sarcastic. I have some sort of a purpose, some sort of a goal in mind for what, I, what it is that I'm doing or saying. And this is expected from what we call al-uqala, anyone with intellect, anyone with wisdom. Is it possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most wise, the creator, the omnipotent God, the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the all-wise, the hakim, all the attributes that we know of him, is it possible that he does something with no purpose? It's impossible. So then the next question should be, what is the purpose? Unfortunately, we're living, and the reason why it's very important to reflect on this is because we're living in the day and age that people has, have mostly lost the plot. They don't know what they're created for, they don't realize it, and they don't even care to know. Instead, they think life is about maximizing pleasure in this world. In fact, in, even when they speak in terms of psychology, they, tr they say and they suggest that the motive behind most of our actions are maximize, maximizing pleasure. So why do I do most of what I do? Is to maximize my pleasure. Even when I'm trying to prevent something bad to happen to me, it's because I want to maximize pleasure. I'm not going to dis disagree with that because if we think of it from a spiritual perspective, there's nothing wrong with it. But the problem is most people get stuck on that concept in a physical concept or in a physical world. So maximizing pleasure for them would be simply physical. Whatever it is that I can do to maximize my pleasure in this world, that is what should be the goal and what I should strive hard for in their view because they have not understood or they have not they are not fully aware even if they're believers I'm not s simply referring to people who are non-believers no many Muslims and Christians and Jews and other groups of faith in by the name or that are labeled with these names Many of them, their faith is so shallow that they don't recognize the importance of doing something to maximize pleasure in the hereafter. They're stuck on maximizing pleasure here. It's as if there's no hereafter. And this is becoming so common that it is hard to tell anyone that there is a world beyond this. Do you realize that? Sometimes it's hard to convince anyone that if we miss out here or if we are losing somehow here, it doesn't mean that it's the real loss. A hero in a movie should not die in their sense, if you know what I mean. If the hero dies, 
There's, a, there's something wrong in the story. Yes? You think this is a depressing movie. How could the hero die? What about the cause of a hero? If he doesn't achieve his, his goal immediately in this world, you think there's something wrong. This is not acceptable. If you watch such a movie, you think this is depressing. Why? Because you see the hero and you want him to be victorious and winning. Now he died. And even if you go further and say, well, he died to save, say, for instance, he is dying for his country so that his country is not occupied or his country is not attacked by certain individuals. Now imagine in that movie, his country does get attacked after they kill him and the movie finishes with that. How would you feel? Think about it. It's depressing. Why? Now let's go back in history and see an example. And first I want us to start with the biggest example that we have, which is the example of Ashura. Huh? The example of Karbala. Who was the hero in, in Ashura, in Karbala? If somebody thinks it was Shimr al Lain, there's a big problem. If somebody thinks it was Umar ibn Sa'd al Lain, there's a big problem. We have serious problems here. If then we realize that the hero was Imam Hussein alayhi salam, then why did the hero die? In such a way. Why was he martyred in such a way? His children too. Even the infant child. If we look at it from a worldly perspective, it's very depressing. Then why is it not depressing for us? Why do, we wanna, why do we share that story? Although we shed tears, but we only become stronger. Nobody becomes depressed walking out of a majlis. Do you see anyone depressed walking out of a majlis? Though they cry, though they shed tears, but they only get stronger. And history tells us that. That it is the followers of Imam Hussein salam that were the strongest in any resistance. Depressed people cannot resist. So what happened then? What happened is we recognize in that story there is victory beyond this world and the era that we're living in. Pleasure is beyond that. And that is the statement that Zainab sallallahu made when she says, to the La'een who asked her, how did you see what God did to you, your brother and your brothers and family members? She said, I saw nothing but beauty. Ma ra'aytu illa jamila, beauty. Beauty? Yes. She saw them being martyred. Now this is the difference. If the hero is a martyr, and some of you who watched some of the movies that were about the martyrs, the great martyrs who were saviors really of their country and so on. Regardless of the physical outcome, you watch that and you see their martyrdom, although you are saddened that such an individual, such pure people, are, their lives are taken, you are saddened, yes, but you don't get depressed. Because you realize these are the people that make humanity what it is. Make us real humans. These are the people that resist the animal part of huma human beings so that we are real humans. We are insan. These are the people who revive insaniya within us. And so we are proud of them. In the life of Imam Jawad alayhi salam, we have great examples of what he saw as a young boy, what he saw to be the real pleasure. Most young children or young 
adolescents, teenagers, are concerned with simply worldly pleasures, physical, most of them. But examples, and this is why we do, we honor these individuals and we remember them. Numajiduhum. We remember them, we honor them because they set out, set out the best examples for us as human beings. He was a teenager when somebody comes to him and he says, why aren't you playing with the children? He says, I was not created or we were not created for simply playing. Ma khulqna. You're, you're talking about a, te a teenager, a young boy. But he realized his purpose in life. He realized that he needs to guide people. So there are people that are going on the wrong path. He needs to guide them. If he wastes his time doing what most other people do, he will not get the chance to. And he realizes that his time is short. Life is short if we realize it. It is very unfortunate. Most of us, we plan for our lives as if we're living the hundred and plus. Most of us. One lady comes to one of the prophets of her time. At their time, they lived long lives. The narration says that her son died and she was weeping and crying, very upset. So the prophet of the time asked her, he said, how old is your son? She said he was very young, he was 300 years old. At their time, they lived long lives. So he said to her, and you're crying and weeping so much, there will come a time that people cannot live beyond 100, or he says 70, if I'm not mistaken or average of a 70, whatever it is. And then he sa she says to him, those people tell me, do those people build houses? She is surprised, if you're only living 70 years, why would you build a house in her view? Yet, unfortunately, many of us, our dream, and at one point I had such dreams, I want to have this farm and this big house and these things. Most of us, our dreams are all about this world, maximizing pleasure in this world, ease, happiness, all of it in this world. Yet Ahlul Bayt sallallahu alayhi saw things differently and realized why they are here. For them, whether they're living in a castle or what they put, Al Imam Al Hadi alayhi salam, what they call Khanus Ta'alik, one of the worst areas when they put him. And one of the companions said, You know, Ibn Rasulullah, I feel bad. This is not your place. The Imam showed him the place that he is sitting. While sitting in that area, the Imam recognized his place as the place that is prepared for him in paradise. And therefore, he, with his abilities, and with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, he showed him where his place is. He says, this is what I see. He, he says to him, look now. He, when he saw what he saw, he says, this is what I see. Now how he showed him, what technology he used, Allahu alam. In any case, Ahlul Bayt recognized that the real homes or the real gardens or the real fruit trees and all these things that we often dream of here, they wanted in the hereafter. And they strived hard for that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, depending on how much more sincerity you have, He gives you more. Even knowledge. Don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discriminates. If anybody thinks that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that God gives the imam and doesn't give me, so he's discriminating. If anybody thinks that God gave Ahlul Bayt and did not give me, therefore God is discriminating, they have not understood the very basics of Ahlul Bayt and the Ma'asumi.
Quran says, we have made them man, humans, the Rusul. And then Quran says, Qul, say if there were angels walking on earth, then God would send an angel as a messenger to them. And since it's humans walking on earth, he sent a human. If anybody tells you they are different, they're non-humans, they have not understood. Their purpose is for them to be humans, like you and I, with desires like you and I. Do they want pleasure like you and I? They have to fight all these things within themselves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that they will be the best in preserving themselves for the akhirah, he purified them, the extra purification, and that is the purpose, and that is the meaning of ayat al-tathir, when he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا صَلُّوا عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدٍ اللهم صل على محمد وآلِ and therefore the Imam is striving, though his time was short. The Imam was martyred, he was, he was not even 26. In a lunar year, he was 25 and few months. In a solar year, not even 25. What we know as 25 is a solar year. Not even 25. Yet, at that young age, the amount of benefit he gave to his community and the to, to the people after him all the way until today is what continued to revive humanity and revive the real Islam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. This is why we honor them. This is why we remember them. We look at the examples in his life and the knowledge that he spread and the wisdom that he shared. One of the incidents which made the Qadi of Baghdad, the highest judge in Baghdad, have the hatred that he had for him and eventually causing him to speak to the Khalifa, the Mu'tasim, then and convince him to poison the imam was over an issue of interpretation of the holy quran then that's that brings me to one important concept uh, on a side note sometimes people tend to say you know quran is for everybody quran is arabic quran is clear bilisan and arabi and mubin and therefore we should be able to read it and interpret it but Quran says, La yamasuhu illa al mutahharun. It does not say, La yamasuhu illa al mutahharun. There's a difference. Mutahharun are the people who purify. Mutahharun are the people who are purified. Who are purified? Quran says, It's Ahlul Bayt, Salawatullah wa salamu alayhim. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهَّرَكُمْ These are the purified ones. It is not yamasuhu in a physical sense. Nobody can understand it except the purified ones. An example of that, Imam Sadiq gives, before I come to the example of Imam Al-Jawad alayhi salam, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, when Abu Hanifa said to him, the Imam said to Abu Hanifa, you, you give fatwa in the people of Basra. That's what I heard. He said, yes. He said, based on what? What's your basis of fatwa? He says, based on the Quran. He said, oh, okay, so you understand the Quran? He said, yes. So the Imam said to him, tell me, what are the cities that Siru, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, walk between them, nights and days in safety, amineen. What are these cities? He says, it's obvious, Mecca and Medina. Then he says to the, the Imam says to him and all the audience, he says, is it a fact that anyone walking between Mecca and Medina is completely safe? 
the amen from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amin means safety, complete, complete safety. He said, is this true? The people said, no, you have not Rasulullah. We know that there are bandits on the way. There are many things that could happen. Even, you know, spiders, scorpions, whatever. He says, where is the amin? He said, I don't know. Then the imam had to explain it to him. This is a scholar that people, some Muslims call an imam. Yet he did not know that simple meaning of the, this the two places that are that you walk between them aminin then the imam says to him it is the quran and us ahlul bayt these are the aminin you between those you are safe ahlul bayt sallallahu alayhi wa alayhim, are the ones who can interpret another example all the judges the greatest judge with a wide beard perhaps the wahhabi beard i don't know maybe the long one, sitting in the, in the court of Mu'tasim. Some narrations say mutawakkil, some Mu'tasim, Allahu A'lam. Perhaps it was mutawakkil before his khilafah, because it was not during the khilafah, the life of Imam Jawad, he was not the khalifa. In any case, the khalifa is sitting, and all these judges are there, and the jurists are there. And the discussion comes on the hand that should be cut according to the Qur'an. And that brings me to another point. Why do we have such a punishment in Quran? Why does the Quran prescribe cutting the hand of a thief? Is that inhumane? And that's what the modern society tries to suggest, that it's inhumane. Quran or Islam is very harsh and inhumane and so on. Why? Because you cut the hands of the thief. First of all, Quran explains why do we have what we call ta'zirat, these punishments. Because that way the society thrives and th survives and lives and is revived, the entire society. And I gave this example several times. You go in some of those countries, although they might not be apl applying their rules properly, but because of the traditions and the culture of those ta'zirat, you have safety even in the golden market, gold, gold market. You go in the gold market, there are stores without any security. No security glasses, bulletproof, whatever, no, none of that. Double exits, double entries, buzzer, none of that. Gold market, and that's how it is. How come? Yet you come to some of the developed countries that are supposed to be the most civilized and if there's no power for a couple of hours, what happens? All the robberies, even the jewelry show. This is the reality of it. Why? Islam tells you how to stop it from its root. You cut one hand, that's it. Nobody does it anymore. But if you get the thief and the murderer or someone who drives a car into innocent human beings and kills them and they get a tap on the back of the hand and they walk off. If that's what's going to happen, then obviously the crime rate will be rising. So Islam sets certain preventative measures so that the society does not go into the crime. And that is why after around 200 years from the life, from the time of the Prophet until the time of Imam Jawad alayhi salam, 200 years, people did not know how to cut the hand. Why? Because there was that fear. Because of the fear, there were no people with the full criteria. There are almost more than 20 conditions for that punishment to occur. And inshallah, another time we'll discuss them. One of them is that the person who steals is not in need, is not in desperate need. And many other conditions. So after 200 years, people are not sure where do we cut the hand from. They came. The judges are there. The Khalifa looks at the Imam. He's young. He thinks now the Imam wouldn't know the answer. So let's ask him and ridicule him. And then the other scholars gave their opinion. One said, this is where you cut the hand from the elbow. Why? Because he says this is part of the wudu and wudu says yad. Uh, wash your hands. So 
So this is where you cut it. Another said, no, this is enough. Why? Because he says, tayammum also says yad, and we all do tayammum on the palm. They came to the imam, they said, what about you? He said, the ulama had given their fatwa, why do you ask me? In other words, he's telling them, if you know that I'm the source of knowledge, why did you ask them? Uh, if not, why are you asking me? Then they insisted, the imam tells them, you cut it from the fingers. Why? How come? He says, because masajid belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are part of the prostration. If you cut it, he cannot do his sujood. Inna al-masajid lillah. This is the wisdom of a young man that made the judge. The, everybody accepted that this makes the most sense. Because if it's a, a question between the elbow to the wrist and then not down to the fingers, based on that interpretation, it's the best. It's the one that makes the most sense. They took it, but the judge could not withstand the fact that he was defeated by that young boy. Eventually, they conv convinced the Mu'tasim. According to some narrations, he then threw his niece, who was the wife of the imam and others say it was through the one of his ministers that they poisoned the imam sallallahu according to some narrations so much pain the, the imam was on in in the last days of his life after the poison sallallahu alayka ya mawlai Ya Aba Ja'far, Ya Muhammad ibn Ali, Ayyuhal Jawad, Ya ibn Rasulullah, Ya Hujjat Allah ala khalqih, Ya Sayyidana wa Mawlana, إنا توجهنا واستشفانا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله Imam Jawad was in, far in the city of Baghdad far from Medina of Rasulullah that's where the Khalifa had brought him away from their beloved city, from their paradise on earth, from Medina. In the last days, he was in so much pain. His son Imam Al-Hadi is watching until the Imam finally departed this world his soul departed but nothing and no day is like the day of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. the imam in the land of Karbala lonely on the plains of Karbala Imam Zain al Abidin is the one narrating. He says, when it was the last moments, everyone came to the tent, worried, confused, what is happening? They came and said that the heavens have changed. The color has all gone black. The heavens that have changed. What is happening? Ibn Rasulullah. Then he says to them, Open the side of the tent. And it, 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 was, it was then that they realized 
that the enemy had beheaded the Imam with the head on the spear. Imam Zayn al Abideen gave his salam. Assalamu alaik. Ya Aba Abdullah. إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم إلهي بمحمد وعلي وفاطمة والحسن والحسين وبالتسعة المعصومين من ذرية الحسين استجب دعواتنا يا الله إلهي بجواد الأئمة يا الله أغننا بحلالك عن حرامك يا الله أغننا عمن سواك يا الله إلهي بالأئمة عليهم السلام اهدنا لمراضي جنبنا أماصيك يا الله شاف مرضانا ارحم موتانا بحرمة السورة المباركة الفاتحة تحفها صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد